capitalist show that I have a tremendous amount of respect for. He is a rock star on FinTwit, the editor of Forest for the Trees, Luke Groman. Luke, welcome back to the Rebel Capitalist Show. It's great to be back. Thanks for having me back, George. I'm excited to be here. <laughs> All right. So the last time we talked, you were bullish on the market, on Bitcoin, gold, and bearish on the dollar. And that was way before the, we'll call it the Cerveza sickness for, for YouTube. So uh, <laughs> how have your views changed? Are they the same? I want to kind of get an idea of what your views are now. Absolutely. So... I think the last time I was on was January 22nd or 23rd, something like that. And uh, a week later, we came out with a report on, as it relates to the equity market, entitled Why We're Turning Cautious Near Term. And we turned cautious, and it was strictly a function of what the Fed was doing with their balance sheet. And so, uh, and I may even mention it in that interview, I don't, I don't recall exactly, but the gist of it was basically that um, we were seeing the Fed had stopped growing their balance sheet uh, around January 1st of this year. And so uh, I would like to say that, boy, I, I was on top of the, the coronavirus thing. Uh, I wasn't. It, it, it caught me by surprise, but sometimes better lucky than good, at least from a tactical perspective, in terms of what ensued, because we were just looking strictly at the Fed balance sheet. And as you recall from our conversation, um, we, we had been saying mid of last year, much of last year, effectively, the Fed is going to have to concede control over the quantity of money to control the price of money. Basically, they're going to have to start capping rates. They started doing that with the repo. You saw the equity mar market melt up that we, we thought would occur, occurred in the back half of last year, came into the year continuing uh, that that would continue. Uh, but a key caveat to that was we, we wanted to see what the central bank, what the Fed's balance sheet would do, that it, that it needed to keep rising to keep the equity market going. And so uh, up until you know, when I was on your show, we we had were seeing it flatten. But I thought, well, maybe it's you know, I don't like to play sort of five minute macro. I like to see, OK, a consistent stretch. So it had flattened out for a couple of weeks or about two, three weeks at that point, And I had noticed it. But like I said, January 31st, we turned near term cautious from a tactical perspective on the equity market. Um, you know, and, and at that point said, look, if the Fed's not going to grow their balance sheet with what we're seeing, then this is going to be good for the dollar in the near term. It's going to be good for treasury bonds, in other words, lower yields. And it's probably not going to be good for much else and, and you know, good for gold, but, but probably not much else. And so, uh, of course, February unfolded the way it did. Like I said, we did not uh, the, 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 the severity with which coronavirus exploded once it sort of hit Italy uh, caught me by surprise. And so, um, that was where we shifted and, you know, in terms of current views, uh, still really like gold, uh, still like really like Bitcoin, um, still like silver. Uh, and ultimately, we're back to this, you know, what's the Fed going to do in terms of the equity market? And they've, they've done a lot. The equity markets responded. I don't think they're doing enough anymore at this point. Yeah, I think a better question is what are they not going to do? <laughs> I mean, my goodness, it, it's just, you know, what I found interesting when this all started is I just from day one, I thought, well, the Fed's just going to do anything they need to to prop up the market. And you kept seeing the talking heads on CNBC or Bloomberg or whatever. And they'd say, OK, the Fed is doing this right now, as an example, this much quantitative easing. And then they try to predict the future like six months down the road as though the Fed is still going to be doing exactly what they're doing right now. And I think what I tried to do is say, OK, well, forget what they're doing right now. What do they need to do to continually prop up the markets and keep interest rates low? And regardless of the regulations, the laws, the you name it that they're just going to ignore everything to could because the economy is really built on asset bubbles and debt and confidence all the things that we talked about so now that the fed's balance sheet is at i, mean, I can't even keep track of it anymore I, it, it's getting close <laughs> it's like it's six getting and a half trillion call it for for, 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 for round you, math you know what was funny too i don't know if it was on our interview or an interview you had with eric but I remember you were talking about the Fed's balance sheet going to $10 trillion. I think it was on our interview. <laughs> it might and, have been. Back, and back then, I was almost like, 
you know, I totally agree with Luke, but I, I hate to admit it because it sounds so crazy to say that. <laughs> you know, it, it kind of makes you like, oh man, should I really put this out there in the in the whole social media universe? But now it's like, how can we not go to 10 trillion? So I, I mean, I, I guess my question is with what the Fed is doing, I mean, how do you see that playing out in the equity markets, in the bond market? And, and obviously gold should most likely go to go to the moon, but really, the, the equity market. I mean, are we in a in a bear market rally? Do you think the Fed's going to print enough, or can they print enough to take it back up to all time highs? What do you think about that? I, they can always print enough, and it's funny you say that, right? Because I usually am historically in my career when people when I feel strongly about something and I say it and people call me crazy, I feel really good because those are situations that have usually worked out well for me. And this was one of those where it was so crazy, even I was a little bit sort of well, like 10 trillion, right, maybe right. by 2022. Like I was really trying to be, you know, cautious with right, the, right. The, the the time and the number, right? And like you said, it became, I think it's fait accompli at this point. I think we could be there by Christmas, uh, if not sooner, if we get a turn down. So, you know, in terms of where we are and what they could do, I, I think there are two different things. There's There's sort of two different things that I'm really focused on. The first is, sort of coronavirus and and what is the interruption what's the shutdown where do we stand and understanding that the longer that that goes on it's a non-linear pace of decline and and disruption going on and so that's the first thing i'm watching okay so i get what's going on in the equity markets it's up and down we, we really don't know if it's a it's a bear market rally or if this is going to go back down and meet the all-time or the lows that we hit a few weeks ago but what about the dollar i know that's the big question and to understand macro what's going to happen in the next six months or year how to position yourself i really think it's about the dollar so how do you see the fed's balance sheet going to, we'll call it infinity and beyond, and then coming up with all these alphabet soup programs, which could potentially increase deposits in the real economy, which increases uh, M2, the broad money, and maybe velocity, as opposed to just base money and bank reserves. But how, how do you see that interacting with the dollar? Absolutely. I agree that the, the dollar is, I think, critical, if not the key component in terms of, of the macro. And the way we've thought about it has been that the longer you've got two portions here we've got the domestic dollar denominated debt non-financial which is call it 47 trillion dollars and then last week there was a really good article uh submitted to zero hedge by michael every at rabobank in which he estimated the size of the euro dollar market at around 57 trillion dollars and that's a, wow. a, a bigger number than i than i had seen before but he you know, show the whole thing. And so the, the dollar short that exists offshore is 57 trillion and domestically it's at least 47 trillion, not including any of the off balance sheet liabilities of, of the US government, et cetera. And that's just non-financial debt. So the way we thought about the dollar is the longer this shutdown goes on, basically for as long as the Fed is not printing enough to create the base money to pay back these loans. Basically, the longer the shutdown goes on, the more the Fed's balance sheet is going to have to move toward fully reserving all that debt. In other words, 47 trillion plus 57 trillion. So the longer the economy remains shut down the way it is domestically and globally as a result of the COVID crisis, the Fed's balance sheet is going to have to move rapidly towards $104 trillion if the Fed wants asset prices to not fall. There's a big, big range around that 104 trillion, but I think it's very instructive that when the Fed was, you know, when you look at what sparked this rally, it was the Fed beginning to grow their balance sheet at a $34 trillion annual rate. And it's a little bit of mathematical gymnastics and that they did 625 billion in a week times 52 gets you to 34 trillion. But when they did, nearly two trillion well i guess it was i guess it was over two well right, right around two trillion in six weeks or you know ten percent of gdp that got the stock market up and so you're talking about two trillion in six weeks so that's uh call it just short of 20 trillion at an annual rate over a six-week span of time 
Um, that's the type of price target, I guess, if you want to think about it in those terms. For the Fed's balance sheet, if they want to contain the dollar and keep asset prices from crashing, if the economy stays uh, shut down or otherwise impaired. And, and why is that a, a key? I, I, the reason I'm going down this rabbit hole, Luke, because I think it'll help people better understand your view. And so why is that crucial? Why is that the component? Is it because we have, if the economy stays like this, you've got the velocity of money so low that the, the Fed has to combat that when typically if the velocity was a lot higher, the, the dollars would circulate through the system so the money supply wouldn't have to be as great? Or how, how does that work? I think it's a right, it, it, that's a right way to think about it, ultimately in terms of how the mechanics, I mean, from, uh, from, from layman's terms, it's really if the economy is running at full tilt, by nature, we're exporting dollars by virtue of us running the trade deficits we're running and, right. and the current we're deficits exporting we're running. stuff and we're exporting green pieces of paper. Exactly. And so that at least keeps that euro dollar, dollar structural dollar shortage fed. It keeps it in some semblance of balance. But if, if there's anything impairing and, and increasingly, once you start to get to these kinds of numbers, $57 trillion, I mean, it's it's it, it's ludicrous, really. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the the amount of growth that you have to get becomes ever greater really right it just small changes end up creating very outsized uh, dollar short squeezes on the other side and so but it's that 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 dynamic of if the economy's not running then the the longer the economy's not running then the more the fed is effectively going to have to basically fully reserve right if 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 velocity zero then then but it, the base money's got to go to one. It almost sounds like that's a, a dollar bull argument, though. It It is. It is. Um, but it's a very bearish uh, risk asset environment, in other words, because and that's where you get into sort of this. I don't even know the right phrase for it, because the U.S. economy is so built on asset prices. In this environment, let's let's say, OK, we've got the 57 trillion offshore, 47 non-financial debt onshore, economy slow, dollar's going to go up, no question, a lot. And just to be clear, uh, Luke, because of this, the, the trillion, 53 trillion offshore, the 40 some odd trillion onshore, that represents dollar denominated debt, therefore dollar denominated demand, either demand. now or in the future. Exactly. OK. And so... Dollar goes up in that scenario. When the economy shut, I mean, if the economy stays shut down, and we wrote this in, in mid-March, we said to our clients, we said, look, in, in an economy where you have open markets, a closed, closed stores, closed borders, and a U.S. net international investment position of negative 51% of GDP, which is you've got in a world where there's $57 trillion short offshore, they're short $57 trillion and they're long net. 11 or 12 trillion domestically, net 40 trillion gross, you can see how this is going to work out, which is they are going to sell, sell, sell. They're going to sell everything down to zero to acquire the dollars to pay down their dollar debt. The reason it's near term, very dollar bullish, if it's allowed to get too far, then it starts to get really weird where I basically bec the, the U.S. economy that backs the dollar collapses to some you know staggering level, uh, and you don't know where that is. And and the hallmark of that would be dollar going to some enormous number, and some point in that in that uh, process, uh, gold gold would go no go no offer, right? You'd basically see basically anyone holding gold would say I, I no longer want dollars because I know gold's wildly underpriced in dollar terms. I know the Fed's going to have to print, and that's where. I don't know where we are in that process, but absolutely, it is dollar bullish. It is it is very uh, risk asset bearish, and then it's U.S. economy bearish and sort of the whole system bearish because the whole system, like you noted, is based on rising asset prices. There is, you know, people say, well, the, the world needs us for consumption. Well, if the dollar gets strong, there is no U.S. consumer because 200 percent of growth and personal consumption expenditure comes from just net capital gains plus taxable IRA distributions, and so. Mathematically, consumption cannot grow unless asset prices are rising. Asset prices 
can't rise mathematically if the dollar's rising too far too fast. So there's the it's almost like a Mexican standoff yeah. where the Fed is trying to manage this, you know, and it's almost like a car where there's no there's no uh, it's an on off switch. There's no dial. It's yeah. more liquidity or you know enough liquidity, not enough liquidity, and there's no in between. And we just went through a period of time where. You know, it, they, they, they grew the balance sheet at a $20 trillion annual rate, and that was enough liquidity. And I'm not convinced that, you know, whatever it was that they quote unquote tapered to this week, I think it was $15 billion a day in treasury, so call it $75 billion a week. <laughs> they <Yes>. tapered to that. <laughs> they tapered to $75 billion a week in treasuries. That appears to not be enough. And I, I think that's right. You know, for as, as long as we're shut down, it's, it's probably not enough. And so that's. That's how I'm thinking about the dynamics. And like you said, it's very dollar bullish. It is very asset bearish. And at some point on that continuum, you get into this weird, you know, basically gold goes no offer. Uh, and then things will start to get really weird. Yes. Okay. So maybe short term, as far as just dollar centric here, we're looking at maybe a, a bullish spike, but then long term, I mean, I'm sure five years out, you're still very bearish on the the US dollar. I don't even think it's 5 years because it's okay. it depends on in in large part how quickly we come back from from the covid crisis and and how fast we ramp up but if what this situation leads to is a case where and and we've started to see this process because ultimately covid was just the snowflake that set off the avalanche in terms right. of basically the biggest debt implosion in biggest debt crisis in history. And so what you're looking at is a situation where you're going to get shrinking time, periods of time between when the Fed goes money on, money off, money on, money off. So that's going to get shorter and shorter and shorter. And the amount of money on each time for as long as the COVID situation doesn't approve is going to get bigger and bigger and bigger. And within all of that, sort of the magic unknowable is when does sort of the, the hundredth monkey wake up and go, Oh my God! This is never stopping. They're going to monetize everything. The balance sheet is going to 100 trillion. I don't want dollars. I don't want any fiat. And and the dollar will probably be the last one that experiences that. I think that's a very fair comment. Uh, but ultimately, because the U.S. allowed its economy to be turned into something that is driven by rising asset prices, the Fed doesn't have a choice. They're going to have to, their choice is how do they want? <laughs> do they want to do this? via fire or via ice, but one way or another, uh, they're sort of in this position where they have to get asset markets up sort of regardless of underlying fundamentals or else everything comes unwound. Yeah. So I, I want to unpack that a little bit more. When I, I say all the time in my videos that uh, the U.S. economy is built on asset prices or asset bubbles, debt and confidence. But I do that just from kind of a, a 30,000 foot view. It's just I think if you're intellectually honest with yourself, you, you can't come to any other conclusion. But obviously, you're a pro. I'm not. And you do tons of research on this. So can you go through some of the actual numbers that show how um, reliant on asset prices the U.S. economy is because it's so consumption based? Yeah, there's a couple. There, there's not like one number that you say the aha thing. So it's a little bit like playing bigger than a breadbasket, but you can you can get to the the sort of that that's the only conclusion you can make. So for example, if you take a look at the breakdown of U.S. tax receipts, you can see that the top five percent of U.S. taxpayers pay sixty percent, six zero percent of the individual tax receipts. And individual tax receipts are about half of overall. So top 5% are paying 30% of overall, 60% of individual. And, and we know these top 5% of taxpayers are not collecting most of their wages in right. hourly. They're not getting paid hourly. They're getting paid incentive comps. So we know that that's ordinary income. That, that's some enormous part of ordinary income as taxed by the IRS is coming from the stock market effectively. Capital that's not gains. even capital gains. That's ordinary income. Or okay. stock options are taxed as ordinary income. So if you go to okay. IRS data and you look at net capital gains plus taxable IRA distributions, those two numbers are around 200% of the annual growth in personal consumption expenditures. And 
PCE is about a $13 trillion annual uh, number in terms of the economy. It's very broad ranging from boats and RVs and you know plastic crap at Walmart to health, certain healthcare services, et cetera. The point is that not that people are selling capital gains or their IRAs and immediately using that to fund consumption, although that might be happening. The point is that it's mathematically impossible for net capital gains and taxable IRA distributions to fall and personal consumption expenditures, consumption in the United States, which is two thirds of GDP to grow. It's mathematically impossible. One is 200% of the size of the growth of the, of, of the, of the underlying. And so you can't have consumer spending growth without net capital gains and taxable IRA distribution growth. And that doesn't even talk about the ordinary income impact from the uh, from from stock options, which are taxed as an entirely different line item. And so, like I said, you can you sort of can back into a number where you just realize it's enormously important. And then you can road test it or acid test it, whether it's anecdotal comments when Fed former Fed uh, Chairman Alan Greenspan said in 2015, he said not a lot of people are paying attention to how important the stock market is to driving tax receipts. If stocks just stop rising, let alone fall, it's quickly going to manifest in a fiscal problem for the United States. And when you look at the data uh, from the Fed, you look at U.S. federal tax receipts against GDP. Uh, yeah, GDP, but total equity market cap. So look at equity market cap against tax receipts. And up until 1995, there was de minimis, de minimis relationship between the two. And then they started to close and have been very close with equities leading tax receipts uh, ever since 1995. And I say, what happened in 1995? President Bill Clinton signed legislation that made cash compensation to executives over $1 million per year, non-deductible to the corporation, but they exempted incentive comp. And so guess what happened in 1995? Everybody went from taking cash comp, which was no longer deductible over a million bucks, to incentive comp. And that's, if you take a look at the data series of wealth discrepancy, when did it really go into hyperdrive? 1995. When did the uh, relationship between tax receipts and equities become not only close, but with equities being a leading indicator? 1995. And so again, it, there's not one data point that says sort of, aha, here I can go on you know the Fed's H.4 and see how much it is. You sort of have to back around into it. But like you said, once you start digging around at just the relative sizes, I can't give you the exact number other than to say it strains credulity to think that it is not critically important. And as such a critical driver, a critical policy lever, basically, uh, if the Fed wants consumption, wants GDP to grow, they have to get the stock market up. No, that's, yeah, you answered my question perfectly. It's it's just you just nailed it right there. That that was that totally makes sense. And you know, I think back at all the research I've done on the um, the tax receipts compared to GDP, and then you layer over the the highest marginal rate, and you see that there's really not too much of a relationship there at all. Whether tax rates are at 90 percent or 25 percent in the 80s and you say well there's a lot of loopholes and but that doesn't explain everything you see the tax receipts really really drop regardless of the highest marginal rate when you have a stock market crash so it just it makes total sense so one thing i'd, I'd like to ask you talked about how the equity prices going up or down really affects consumption uh, how would you layer the equity that people have in real estate on top of that level of consumption, because I would imagine that uh, that the that, that Americans, the average American, has even more of their net worth tied up in their home equity than they even do the stock market. Yeah, I think they I think they probably do, right? I mean, the for the average American, certainly, because you're talking about I think homeowners equity. I haven't checked the number recently, but I want to say it was a ten, you know at the peak last time it was ten trillion, and I think we surpassed it a couple years ago, a few years ago. So my guess is it's probably a Ten to twelve trillion dollar annual number against call it you know four hundred one k's and stuff's twenty five trillion, but that's very concentrated, right? It's not as as broadly spread. Right, so my guess right. is that's probably the case, and it's interesting because I think they sort of feed on each other. Um, you know, I have a very a very dear friend of mine uh, who is an architect in a southeast uh, southeastern U.S. Uh, vacation uh, high end region, and it was interesting back in two thousand eight. He started getting calls. So I'll never forget he called me. He goes, I had a client today call me, you know, 
you know, so-and-so, I, I have uh, two numbers for you, 43 and 8. My friend said, okay, what, what are the numbers? And 43 was the price of my stock when we started this project. 8 is the price of my stock when I stopped this project, uh -huh. you know, and, or the price of my stock now, and I have to stop the project. And so that's what I mean. It starts to kind of feed on itself of rates, obviously, I think, are the biggest driver to that homeowner's equity piece. Income's uh, uh, one of the biggest drivers. But then because of what we talked about before, where so much of the marginal propensity to consume is being driven by the equity market effectively, the, it, it's sort of it's sort of you get this feedback effect where if stocks are rising, someone might be more inclined to buy another home or might be more inclined to put more money in their home or, or take on a home equity line or however you that works out. But it sort of feeds on itself. But I that's how I kind of think about is, is ultimately this all right. It's not just the stock market. It's rising asset prices as well, to your point. Yeah. So how would higher interest rates play into that? I mean, I, I, I know how they would, but for the, the viewer that's watching it thinking, OK, well, I know if rates go up, that means mortgage rates up. That means real estate prices most likely down. So if what Luke is saying is that there's this kind of daisy chain. Well, that means maybe stock prices go down. And what does that mean for the Fed? I can see them just trying to put these pieces of the puzzle together. So I'd ask you that first and foremost. Secondly, do you see a possible scenario where the Fed could get inflation so high, or it, whether the Fed gets there or not, inflation is running so high that they can raise interest rates without it being completely destructive to the financial economy? Or is it? Or, or is there, there just so much debt that even if inflation's running at the 1970s, e increasing the um, interest rate when because there's so much debt that has to be rolled over will still crush the system? I'm going to start at the end there and work backward from there because I think that's ultimately what you just said. I think is ultimately the most important takeaway okay. and the thing that's very different than the 1970s, which was between demographics, debt, etc. We're simply in no position to absorb the types of rates if inflation starts to rise. And so whether inflation ever hits 10 percent, 15 percent, I don't think it'll ever be officially reported as 10 or 15 percent. I think it'll be reported yeah, exactly. as two or three. And uh, and so what you can take from that then is, is the Fed will move heaven and earth to not. To, 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 to not allow that to happen. And they can, they can you know, not allow that to happen. They can grow their balance sheet as far as they need to grow yeah. it to cap rates. Yeah, World uh, War II. And, I think you mentioned that last interview, the Frankenstein yield curve with World War II. Exactly. And, and I think it's important to highlight, you know, one of the things we said uh, was, in theory, because the net international investment position is so negative for the U.S., you know, when we went into the 08 recession, it was negative 9 or 10%. 1996, it was negative 1 or 2%. It's negative 51% now, which just means foreigner own, foreigners own a lot more assets of ours than we own of theirs. Yeah. And so in a time where there's this massive dollar shortage, particularly offshore, when they need dollars, they're going to sell. And so... Right. It always made sense to me that at some point in a bad enough crisis, you would see U.S. Treasury yields not fall like they always had, but actually rise, which is a, a would be a very unusual thing. And so uh, and the, the rates would rise because of all these foreigners that own or foreign entities that own the, the debt. They're selling the debt. Therefore, there's less demand. Less demand means the interest rates rise. Exactly. Basically, yeah, they create a supply and demand mismatch by selling to acquire dollars. And what's really interesting to me is initially in the COVID sell off, Treasury yields down a lot, uh, stocks down a lot, gold initially got sold at first. And then something really interesting happened on March 9th, which was the Treasury market, Treasury bond market, you'll get TLT, it began crashing basically dollar for dollar with the equity market. And the bid ask spreads in treasury markets began blowing out wider than guys have been trading that their whole lives had ever seen. And you know, his, for, for for the listeners, when you see bid ask spreads blow out, that's a sign of an illiquid market. It's a sign of a of, of a problem. And the treasury market, the TLT, kept crashing. Basically, TLT crashing means yields are rising. So you have the stock market falling a thousand, fifteen hundred points, and the long bond crashing right alongside in percentage percentage terms with it. And so we were witnessing 
that very phenomenon from call it March 9th through March 16th or 17th. It was over a week. And what we've found out since uh, last week, the Fed released meeting minutes from their March 15th meeting. And what they said in there in the minute says the Treasury market has stopped functioning effectively. And the reason that was, I think, is you had this mismatch where dollar, massive dollar shortage offshore, dollar was spiking, risk off, need dollars, sell what you can, and they just began dumping treasuries. And when you start looking at that from that perspective, what the Fed began doing was effectively a bailout of the treasury market. You know, they say it was a bailout of the hedge funds, and right. there was some of that, but as, as I think we might have said on the show and we've been writing about with, for, for clients, the the, the bailout for hedge funds was not a hedge fund bailout. The hedge funds were the biggest marginal buyers of treasuries over the last 12 to 18 months. And so they needed to be bailed out so that they could keep buying treasuries because whatever they didn't buy, the Fed was going to have to buy. And so we can see with what the Fed did in terms of the treasury buying mid-March on was effectively a bailout of the treasury market. And FEMA. Uh, uh, oh, what versus via... Go well, I'm just talking about the FEMA, the the basically the repo market that the Fed set up for uh, central banks, so oh, yes. they would have to sell their treasuries, exactly. so they get the treasuries onto the Fed's balance sheet. So there's not there's not a seller. I mean, there's I think it goes right back to that. One hundred percent. That's one hundred percent what happened. And so when you to tie it back to your question of rising rates. This, this, it, like I said, it's almost this Mexican standoff, and it ties back to the earlier point of the dollar. Anytime the dollar gets too strong, they're going to start dumping, rates are going to start rising, equities are going to start falling, and, and you start this, this vicious deflationary loop that, left untouched, ends with the dollar at some extraordinarily high number, equities at some extraordinarily low number, the wealth of the country destroyed, banks, the banking system destroyed equity values and whole houses destroyed and the extraordinarily strong dollar unable to buy you you know goods at all times in stores and unable to buy you physical gold at all that's sort of the nas so the fed is trying to manage that with liquidity on liquidity off liquidity on liquidity off right and i ultimately there needs to be some sort of structural adjustment whether that's a, a monetary conference or a devaluation of the dollar like uh a closet or 2.0 Plaza Accord 2.0. I mean, the Fed could do it unilaterally, Fed and Treasury. They could say, listen, to, to overcome COVID, we are, uh, Trump could say, I've instructed the Fed to uh, you bid, you know, bid for the Treasury's gold at $20,000 an ounce, or the Fed, you know, Fed, Fed to bid for Treasury's gold and then remit the money over to Treasury, and Treasury is going to spend that money into the economy. And it would amount to Basically, a massive, massive restructuring of the U.S. You would have a whole lot more GDP with not more debt. You would be writing down the debt to GDP. You'd be writing gold effectively up massively. Uh, it'd be a really bullish, stimulative uh, step, but it's it's effectively a devaluation, a big devaluation uh, of the currency, and, and kind of a, a unilateral restructuring of the system. Yeah, I mean, it's basically like dropping a hundred thousand dollars in every American's bank account. Yeah, just, and not letting interest rates adjust to a, to a, to adjust for, it. and that yeah, that's where I think we're going some version of that, whether it's yeah, via so curve control or what have you. And that's you know, to me, I get the 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 dollar bonds, uh, the trade, uh, and, and it's it's been a monster, absolutely. For me, I just I think we're much closer to some sort of binary outcome, particularly the longer this COVID crisis goes on. Because the longer it goes on, there's really only two outcomes. Either they print, they fully reserve all, all that debt, or they don't, and the system implodes, and we wake up. You know, the Dutch National Bank hinted at, at how that gets resolved. You know, they said we hold gold because if the system collapses, it's going to be rebuilt using gold. And that's not going to happen with gold at 1800 or 2000 or 2500 right. That's going to happen with gold with probably an extra zero at the end of it and probably a different number in front of it. So I... For me, I just have always rather just held the gold because I can't time it. Because understanding this crisis hitting where it is, as, as big as it is and as physical as it is. In other words, this isn't just a problem, a paper problem that the Fed can print over. These are exo this is an exogenous supply chain shock happening at a time where you had big change anyway. You know, these things, they, they, they don't go linearly. They go linearly for a bit and then they go all at once. Yeah. How do you see the cross current? 
of or cross currents with the U.S. economy right now, where we've got potentially a massive demand shock, while at the same time we have a huge or potentially a huge supply shock with uh, the global supply chains being disrupted, maybe deglobalization, while at the same time the demand is really suffering. It, it, those are two opposing forces. So the question becomes, which one is stronger for how long and at what time? How do you see that? It's a great question. And I don't know that I have a great answer. I mean, I, I, I'm watching them both very closely. I have a very good friend who's a fourth generation farmer, and he was talking about the hog, they're, they're hog, hog producers, right? So they have to deliver hogs to the processors. And so it's a, it's a situation not too different from what we've been watching with oil, which is they had hogs to go and the processors are shutting down. And so they ended up getting like a buck a hog. I mean, it's, I, I don't even know what a hog goes for normally, but it's the same kind of, it's the same kind of dynamic. It's, it's not a buck a hog. It's probably a multiple, a big multiple of, of that. So it's the same dynamic as, as we've seen in oil. And so that's in the very near term deflationary. If it's allowed to get too far on the other side, now on the processor side, there's nothing coming out the back end either. So at the consumer side, it's already starting to be inflationary, right? So they, so for example, you've got deflation, or inflationary CPI from that food dynamic, deflationary wholesale PPI. Um, I, I think... And, and you've got the Fed massively increasing their balance sheet, which is also, again, with, with monetary velocity, to your point, not, you know, de minimis. It's, 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 it's nowhere. Um, they're just filling in a hole right now. Right. Um, and so it's, it, there's not a risk of that. The flip side is, is if this thing persists, A, where you get more sustained breakdowns of supply chains, then I think you start to be a bit more concerned. And then bigger picture... I ultimately think what's happening is is very inflationary because of what's what what this what this crisis has taught us, which is for the last twenty years. I was, I was saying this to a friend uh, recently, where he, he asked me, "How could we have allowed so much of our pharmaceutical supply chain, and how can how can we allow all these masks? Where we're the most powerful country in, in on the world, and we're begging China for masks, we're begging China for drugs. How did this happen?" I said, "We well, have to understand the average." senior neoliberal economist, the average senior policymaker, decision maker, think tank senior guy is, let's say, let's say 60 years old. He or she's 60 years old. That would make them uh, 29 in 1989 when the Berlin Wall came down. Mm -hmm. And so they have never in their professional careers been in a, a senior seat at a time when the U.S. was not a unilateral power, where it wasn't everything just governed by make it cheaper, introduce, or increase complexity, you know, more just in time, more complexity, lower sourcing cost is better. Right. It's always worked. Lower rates, lower cost, more complexity, and it's always worked. And if you go back to 10 years ago, five years ago, two years ago, certain senior business leaders, uh, certainly senior DOD people were saying, you know, hey, guys, this, this is a problem. We, we're, we're borrowing money from China to build weapons to face down China, and China's a sole source component on certain critical aspects of what we're buying from China with borrowed money from China. This this probably is something we should look into. And I just think the inertia of the system. People say, yeah, yeah, yeah. Don't 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 worry. And what I think what may be the most lasting impact of this crisis is that those people that were saying, yeah, 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 they've been discredited because now. They're going to go in a meeting and go, yeah, 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 and they're going to go, COVID. We couldn't get yeah. friggin' masks, dude. We couldn't get antibiotics. You're, yeah. you're done. I'm done with your advice. Thank you. Go home. And the people that are saying we need to bring stuff back, we need to you know, make, make, make supply chains more robust, relocalize, those people are going to have a much greater seat at the table. You've heard the president talk about it. You've heard other people talk about it. Well, that's a good thing in my view, but that's also a very inflationary thing in my view because the, the supply chains aren't here. The infrastructure isn't here. And when we build it, it's going to cost. It's going to tighten up labor markets. It's going to tighten up demand. It's going to use commodities, et cetera. So in the context of all this, I think we're still in, in a deflationary uh, mindset. But ultimately, you know, and that doesn't even touch on what the currency or the currency system needs to do to make it make sense for us to bring supply chains back, which is dollars got to get weak and the structure of the dollars reserve system uh, status has to be has to be restructured right because the deal was 
we send you our jobs in factories, you send us stuff, we send you dollars, you send us the dollars back to buy treasuries and basically vendor finance us and away we go. Well, if we're bringing the stuff back here, like they don't have the factories anymore. We're building it ourselves. We're not sending the dollars out. The whole system isn't structured for that. And that requires a, a restructuring that system, which by, by, by almost definition, the balance of payments changes in a way that the dollar has to get a lot weaker. And then that would be inflationary almost equal. But I'm not even talking about that. I'm just saying if we bring this stuff back, it's inflationary. Yeah, for sure. This make, yeah, this makes a lot of sense. And I, I, it's something I've been talking about in my videos a lot with uh, deglobalization and you you made the exact points that I've I've hit on and obviously I haven't done the research or as much research as you have but just kind of thinking it through it makes a lot of sense that just the average joe on the street after the the cerveza sickness gets done they're going to be like what no I, I, no more pharmaceuticals in china we need to bring this stuff home but the, the problem there i think the average person just assumes that we can just flip a switch and just decide to start making everything you see at Walmart right here in the United States and everything's going to be fine and dandy. And, and they don't understand that, that that is so complex and that takes so much capital investment and that requires wages at $2 an hour when most likely wages are going to be at probably, let's call it $15 an hour at a very minimum. And so you have all of those additional costs. So I guess my question would be, can we kind of walk through how that would work, bring those supply chains back into the United States? <laughs> then how long would it take? I mean, is this like five years, like 10 years? And then how much would that, or how much uh, would prices go up of the things that the average Joe and Jane buys on a daily basis. And I know I, I've done a little research with what really, as far as the big blockchains that people go to every single day, we're talking about Walmart, we're talking about Target, Lowe's, Home Depot's, the, those are pretty much the, in the top 10 of um, importers from China. Yep. So if just let's use those four as an example, if they have to, if Walmart, Target and Home Depot have to start making all of their stuff in the United States, what does that do to the prices and how long would it take? And I guess the, the rebuttal that I always hear from people is, hey, we did it in World War Two. It was no problem. We just flipped a switch and started making aircraft carriers and all these things to win the war. So if we can do it back then, we can do it now. And I, I'm a little skeptical there. What do you think? <laughs> yeah, there's there's a lot to unpack there. So let me. So, I think the first way to think about it, I, I reached out to a good friend of mine who's uh, in the freight forwarding business, who's who's pretty tight in, and said, "Hey, how long does it take?" And we we went back and forth, and I think where I came away from that conversation was. If you just just purely trying to objective objectively looking at it. China, it took China 20 years, right? Maybe even a little longer, but conservatively, let's say it took them 20 years to sort of do what they did. And they did it about as fast as anybody in history. Right. It's a dictatorship. Yeah. And it, it, the environmental requirements, et cetera, et cetera. Right. They've got uh, the 10 biggest container ports in the world in terms of throughput. They've got seven of them. Um, and, and we might not need to replicate those per se, if we're putting stuff in Mexico and in the U.S., of course, but you're still talking about, you know, rail infrastructure, truck infrastructure, et cetera. So to me, I say, okay, 20 years, let's say we do it twice as fast as that, 10 years to really fully get everything back. So I don't think it's going to be an overnight thing. With that said, I, I think... I would probably take the under by a little bit on 10 years if only we now have the excuse both in terms of making the general awareness of just every guy on the street now knows we were short drugs and masks. This doesn't make sense. And we furthermore have there's there's no discussion anymore. MMT, helicopter money, just print the money. Right. So. Uh, Paul McCulley, uh, who was formerly of PIMCO, I think he's at Princeton now, economist, he was the one who came up with the policy that was famously cited by Paul Krugman in 02, 
you remember Paul Krugman wrote a, uh, a piece in the New York Times. He said, we need a housing bubble. You know, if we listen to Paul McCulley at PIMCO, we need a housing bubble to offset the demand loss from the stock bubble. Yeah, yeah. And sure enough, we got one, right? Greenspan built it, handed it off to Bernanke, and the rest, as they say, is history. Well, Paul McCulley now was in the New York Times a week ago saying, just print the damn money. We don't need to discuss it. Just print the money. And so to me, you've got the awareness created and you have the inertia where there's nobody that's going to say, hey, you know, to get over COVID, let's build an interstate. Let's build rail lines. Let's build factories. Let's, it doesn't matter. Like it is just a rubber stamp through Congress right now. Trump will sign anything. And so I think to some degree, the speed at which we can do this is probably a function, a bit of, of the outcome of the election. If we get four more years of Trump, I mean, we could see some absolutely staggering amounts of stimulus. And I'm just thinking out loud here at this point. But, um, you know, when you talk about the wages, I think it all you, your point's absolutely right. It's not two bucks a day. It's at least 15 bucks a day or 20 bucks a day. But that ultimately is really a function of the currency. Right. If and the currency relative to the living standards of the populace. And ultimately, if you look at average worker, he's got two big, you know, he's, he's, he's got. He's got a house, he's got a car, and he's got sort of healthcare food, right? In terms of his big, his big expenses. And so, if if his mortgage is not going to be allowed to rise by the you know courtesy of the Fed, then you could look at what's almost a you know debt jubilee, if you will, to much of America, where the Fed pins his yield, pins his mortgage at a certain rate, and then we do a whole bunch of stimulus. We maybe we devalue the dollar in the manner I described earlier, whatever, whatever, the, however that's structured. But let's say his wages rise 10, his, his or her wages dry, rise 10, 15, 20 percent a year for five years. Now we wake up and you've got a guy making something more akin to what he was making 50 years ago. When we went off the gold standard in terms of a real wage relative to his fixed expenses. And you look in that environment. We can compete. The dollar falls on global markets. We can compete. We're much more self-contained. Um, it, it's a really good economy. Uh, you know, the downside is if you hold bonds, you, you the American public thanks you for your donation on a real basis. You know, you yeah. won't have lost any money, but you know they will have gone from buying you. I mean, they'll they'll they'll, they'll have collapsed in real terms. Yeah, for sure. As well, and that's what happened in World War II, by the way. You know, bondholders. Got every dime they were promised, but the equity market rose five x, and real rates were negative for not only the duration of the war, but all the way through fifty one, and then for the you know roughly half the time from fifty one through seventy nine, I think. Yeah, it's 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 interesting you say that. I don't think a lot of people realize that there were a couple years in nineteen in the nineteen forties where the rate of inflation was actually higher than the nineteen seventies. And it's, um, yeah, so the, the bottom line is that that would be a, a really interesting or a tough uh, rope for the tight rope for the Fed to really walk if you've got to manage the or try to manage the the rate of wages going up and trying with the rate of inflation. And hopefully the rate of inflation doesn't exceed those wages too much because then you really get into a pinch. Although your wages are going up in real terms, they're going down. You can buy a lot less that reduces consumption. It's uh, that that's uh, there's a lot of components, a lot of variables there to say the least. Well, there are. And it's, you know, I think it's important that in the early stages of that, They've got more, I think, more wiggle room than is appreciated in, in terms of because there's so much debt out there. If they're basically going to nationalize the debt markets, which, you know, the. In, in other words, there's so much dollar demand out there. I, I want to rephrase it so it really, I think, sinks in with the average viewer that it's, it's, it, yes, it's because there's so much debt out there. But what that means is there's so much dollar demand out there's there. There's so much, there's so much dollar demand out there. If you let wages rise at first, you don't have to worry so much about is food rising faster than wages because the mortgage isn't rising at all. The car payment isn't rising at all because yeah, those yeah. rates are not going to be allowed to rise. They are going right, to so be the transfer of wealth from the lender to the borrower that might compensate for the food costs going up faster than the wages. Exactly. Even if it happens that way for a bit, your wages, if you're, you know, say your food costs go up 10 and your wages go up 10, 
your mortgage ain't going up at all and, and yeah. your car payment's not going up at all and your right. taxes probably aren't going up quite as fast. And so you've got some flexibility because that debt number is so big, you've got some room. And again, at some point the bond market wakes up to that, but what are they, they're basically going to, the bond market will get put to the Fed. And, yeah. <laughs> and, and we've seen, you know, we, what does that look like? The bond market getting put to the Fed is what we saw in mid-March. That's $625 billion a week. And they just did it. <laughs> All right. So, I, 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 we've, man, I wanted to get to this topic like two minutes into our conversation. And here <laughs> we are. We've gone about uh, 45, 50 minutes. So, I could talk to you for hours, buddy. But I really want to touch on what's happening in the oil market. Just to get everyone up to speed, if they're watching this a little late, yesterday, the price of oil dropped down at one point to negative $40 a barrel, <laughs> negative $40 a barrel. So for, for, and I think the average guy or gal out there, Luke sees that and they're like, what the hell is going on here? <laughs> like, is this some crazy movie that I just woke up into this nightmare? And then they look at the market and the market's really kind of blowing it off. And uh, what actually happened? Is this because of fundamentals? Is this because of technical issues? So let's start with what happened and how the hell oil prices can get to negative 40. And then we'll try to just walk the viewers through it and maybe what might happen moving forward. Sure. So I think, you know, there's gonna be other better people to talk to in terms of all the technicals of the contract and how that all works. But with that said, I think there's two key takeaways from this. I think takeaway number one is that it's largely fundamental in terms of GDP is down 30 to 40. It's down huge globally. Demand, I think I saw a number last night, 29 million barrels a day of oil production that just doesn't have a home. There's you you couldn't, there's no group of countries really that could cut enough to take it away or to to to, to sort of balance those markets. And so you're left with a situation where global storage is filling up. And once global storage fills up and there's no place to take the stuff, the you know, I've said a number of times in, in conversations, you know, the CFO, one of the biggest uh, traders in the uh, commodity traders in the world told me 15 years ago the, 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 the in commodities, the marginal ton prices the whole. Right. The, the, the marginal barrel, the marginal ton of oil doesn't have a home right now. There's no place to store it. There's no demand for it. And so the price goes to zero. And in theory, there's maybe some sort of cost attached to taking it away or please get it away from me. So you could see modest negative numbers and you'd started to see a little bit of that in terms of some of the uh, differentials and, and what have you sort of in the far reaches of, of the Canadian oil sands and maybe even out into the Bakken a little bit here in the US. Uh, but negative 40, so, so point one is, is I think it's a largely fundamental supply demand coronavirus, uh, et cetera. The negative 40, I think though, also speaks the fact that it got that negative I think speaks to the level of paper derivatives, the amount of paper derivatives in the energy market broadly and commodity or specifically in commodity markets more broadly, that you had this group of people that just had to sell. And the fact that it could go that negative, I think speaks to how much um, how much paper has been, how, how much these commodity markets have been uh, financialized relative right. to, you know, sort of where the papers, you know, the paper entails wagging the physical dog. So they, they buy the futures, they buy paper gold, and then at a certain time in the month or a certain date, they can either roll that contract or they have to actually take delivery of the physical oil. And if they're just some guy in his, in his house in the middle of Indiana, probably not going to have anywhere to store 10,000 barrels of oil, <laughs> let's call it. <laughs> and then the, 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 the logistics or the cost of rolling that contract over becomes cumbersome to the point where the only thing you can possibly do is pay someone to take this contract that you've purchased, pay someone where they might have some some storage facility or some oil tanker off the coast of Houston where they can actually store this stuff because the the storage in Oklahoma and everywhere else that you typically store is just at its limit 
because the price is so low, but the shale producers and everyone else has to continue to pump because they can't just turn an on and off switch type of thing. So I, I think, you know, the guys on Real Vision yesterday did a fantastic job of describing it in a way that everyone can understand. They said, let's say you're having a garage sale or a yard sale and you're selling your couch. You start off for asking 300 bucks. And then the garage sale, you get done, it's it, it's closing time, the sun's going down, everyone's going away. And then now all of a sudden, you've got to move your house, let's say, so you can't, you don't have anywhere for this couch. And then finally, you get to a point where, you, where you're willing to pay somebody just to take the couch away because you've got nowhere to store it. And it's kind of like the exact same thing that happened in the oil market. Yeah, I think that's fair. I think it's very fair. And it's... um. Yeah, I think that's exactly right. And, it, you know, it speaks to the level of financialization out there, just that there's, you know, that much paper to move uh, at the end of a contract, you know, at, at, when it's time to roll a contract, as I understand it. So do you think this is going to be a, a problem moving forward in the oil markets if demand stays this low or maybe even goes lower if we have a second wave of, of the cerveza sickness? <laughs> we'll <call it. laughs> and then do you see that same type of thing maybe happening in the paper gold market or paper silver? I know Schiff was talking about maybe the same thing happening, but the reverse uh, would the price would go to the through the roof in the gold markets because instead of having too much oil, there would be too few gold, too few uh, amount of physical gold for the actual uh, amount of people that hold paper. Yeah, so I, I think it's. I mean, I don't know if, uh, today this afternoon the, uh, the 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 June contract actually uh, fell below ten bucks. Fell Did it? I didn't know yeah. that. Yeah. Wow. So it started. It that process has started. I think, and I think so. Absolutely, I think it's a. I think it's an issue, uh, and it'll continue to be an issue for as long as, um, you know, that the the uh, um, you know the, the we've got the economy shut down, and you just have this stuff piling up. Because I think that's the right metaphor in terms of there's just, you know, in in commodities, the marginal ton price as a whole, and the price of the marginal ton zero or less, and uh, because there's just no, no demand for it and no place to store it, and yeah. so. You know, that that I think is something we'll continue to see. And in terms of the gold market, I'm of two minds of this. And, you know, when I tweet, I tweeted, you, uh, we were talking about before we started. Yeah. The tweet I wrote today. So if you look at the structure of the gold market, you know, so first off, I think it's important to highlight that gold and oil are very different in an important way. A lot of people want to lump them together as commodities. If you look at their stock to flow ratios, they couldn't be more different. Stock to flow is just how much is an inventory relative to how much we use. Uh, and the stock to flow ratio of oil is call it one to two X. And so um, the way to think about a stock to flow ratio is is basically uh, how many shells are in a shell game, right? So stock to flow ratio of one to two, I mean, there's one to two shells in the shell game. So you don't have to turn too many shells over till you find the P. And the P is supply demand, you know, physical supply demand fundamentals. And so the punchline is you can't get supply demand that fundamentals that far away from oil in the future, sort of almost no matter how much paper you, you, you throw on it. Gold is a different animal entirely. Gold is a stock to flow ratio of around 60x. So there are 60 shells you can turn over before you find the P of, of supply demand fundamentals. Wow. And so you can pile a lot of paper on there to uh, massage price uh, away from supply demand fundamentals for a very long period of time. Now, I'm of two minds, with that as background, I'm of two minds of how this could play out for gold. Because I, if we just look at it from a straight metaphor to what happened in oil and what we're seeing in physical gold demand, then you would think it would be exactly the opposite. You've got all the storage you need and people would not have a problem storing more and more and more. Uh, and you've got more and more demand and less and less physical. And so at some point you could see price resolve uh, on the upside in the way gold has resolved in the last, or excuse me, the way oil has resolved on the downside the last couple yeah. of years. And I, I think that's right, but I, I, the only thing that makes me hesitant is we saw if you understand the structure of the gold market with all that paper, because the stock to flow is so high, what we're really talking about is the gold market is structured as basically a massively levered 
uh, fractionally reserved banking system. Mm. And, you know, basically a stock to flow of 60 means you've got basically, you know, 60x levered your capital with your capital as the physical underlying and, and, and the 60, you know, 60x leverage. And so we saw in 2013 when the Chinese showed up and started saying, give me the gold, give me the gold, give me the gold, give me the gold, and started taking that underlying capital out of that levered system, the price of gold didn't rise, it crashed. And that was because basically when they started buying up the physical, you saw the uh, the, the gold forward curves invert, and once the gold forward curves invert, it triggers uh, hedging, selling at the, in the spot market from uh, uh, the bullion banks. And so something that is, in theory, the most bullish thing possible for gold, which was the biggest creditor in the world showing up and saying, give us the physical. We'll take everything that's bolted down and everything that's not bolted down and some that is bolted down. And it was actually very bearish because of you know what was basically, it was a bank run on gold. And so... It's very confusing at times. I think the best way to think about it is think about Lehman Brothers in 2008. When people started showing up at Lehman and saying, we want more collateral, people wanted Lehman collateral. That wasn't good for Lehman stock. Lehman stock fell because Lehman's stock was effectively a levered liability to Lehman collateral. And so when people started pulling collateral out of Lehman, Lehman stock, Lehman bonds fell. China did the same thing to the gold bullion market in 2013. They showed up and started pulling the collateral out of the gold bullion market and the price fell. What I was talking about in that tweet is if that happened, now what's, what's interesting is it seems like, and I, I added on the back of that tweet, if you look at where the physical gold is flowing in this situation, it's flowing into New York. And so the price of gold has been rising with the flows of gold into New York. When the gold flowed away from London and New York in 2013, the price of gold crashed which is curious. And, and my point before is it could resolve itself in the former way, but I think you also need to be aware that, A, it could resolve itself, the wrong people start asking, you know, quote unquote, the wrong people start asking for too much gold. It could create this bank run dynamic in gold prices, um, but that ultimately central banks are gonna let it go negative. They're not gonna let it go to zero because there are enough people out there who know what gold is. They know what physical gold is. They know what physical gold is actually really worth, and they'll take it all. And the central banks are not going to leave their vaults open to cover all those paper contracts. Gold would start falling, 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 and at some point, either they would shut that market down or gold, central banks would be buyers, basically, of gold and demonstrating that in the market to put a floor under that market, and that would be the end of the sell-off. And mm -hmm. I don't know which of those cases it is. But to me, it's ultimately different than the oil market. But you could see, you know, like I said, you could see one of these two paths. Um, ultimately, I think gold's going a lot higher. So I don't want to confuse viewers on that standpoint. But I think it's important to sort of understand, depending on where the physical demand comes from, it can lead to a, a bank run dynamic in the near term. And we saw that in 2013. Okay. Wow. That is so interesting, Luke. So before I, I let you go, how would you suggest the average person out there position themselves in gold now? What what I usually do, or in Bitcoin or silver, anything like that, what I typically do is I just compartmentalize my portfolio. And this is, if anyone asks me, this is what I tell them. You just have 10% physical gold for insurance, 10% speculation, just because you think the price is going to go up, and then 80% investment, meaning it has to pay you to own it. But as far as maybe your position size uh, in physical gold or maybe buying the miners or maybe buying gold or Bitcoin or silver as a speculation, knowing what you just said and knowing that there's a, a, a possibility, maybe it's not probable, but a possibility that uh, gold goes down a lot farther might be a better buying opportunity. But yet I, I doubt you'd say, okay, sell all your gold right now and wait to buy it back in six months because the the chances of this happening are maybe let's call it five percent so because you're just going through a thought experiment so how would you suggest the average person take what you just said and apply it to their own portfolio so the, if the average person to apply what i just said to their portfolio i would say two things i think for me i just like own, owning gold bullion coins miners royalty companies i think um, I, you know, the majority of my gold ownership is in physical bullion coins uh, because it just takes away it takes away the risk of, of operational the term, execution with, with the intent of just keeping it forever. 
Yeah, because I think in addition to being insurance, I think it is I, I think it is going to be repriced one time. I think it is effectively going back into the system. It's going to be need, need to be made much bigger relative to global trade to serve a role as some sort of neutral asset. I think that will happen one time and then I'll figure out what I want to do with it from there. In terms of what to do with the possibility that that because of the structure of the gold market that you could get this paper sell off. Uh, I just would I, if, if I owned it, I would want to scale my position to my understanding that that's a possibility so that if it does happen again, like it happened in 2013, you don't get shaken out of it. You're not so big that you get shaken out of it and that you just you just understand, OK, there's this run happening and I can see it happening and it might not feel good. But if you're sitting there so big that you're doing your net worth calculations and you're taking food off your table, well, that's that's right. that's not helping you. It, right. But if but if you understand that, hey, this could happen. And if it does, I have dry powder. I'll just buy more. Um, just understanding that the, the market is structured in that way, um, that it just gives you some level of comfort. So when you're watching things happen, right? I mean, we saw it, we saw it a little bit in March. I mean, there was mostly just people selling, you know, pay, pay, paper future contracts when you, you sell what you can, not what you want to. And so we saw in the early stages of the crisis in March, um, gold sold off with equities pretty sharply. But if you looked at some of the underlying dynamics and Royce Abag over at Gold Money highlighted some of those and some of the spreads between New York and London, the underlying dynamics were suggesting this, the, people are still flocking to gold. It's just this dynamic of, of paper selling and, and has nothing to do with what's happening to the physical. And so I think it's just important to understand, um, particularly as people are, are getting more involved with the gold market, I think, given everything else that's going on around us. Yeah. So bottom line, keep a little uh, dry powder to maybe take I think advantage that, I think of that's right. but also yeah, I think it's psychologically, right. just make sure that you're prepared for anything so you don't get shaken out of the market in case you see this dramatic price drop. You know why it's going down. So you're not freaking out if you've got a, a substantial position in, in gold or silver or anything like that. Then w what about Bitcoin? What do you think? And I, I know I'm taking too much of your time. No, okay. Sorry. What, what, what do you think about the halving and what's going on with Bitcoin? Do you think that's a short term bullish factor, kind of a, a non-issue? Do you see it? I know you're bullish long term, but how do you see it playing out in kind of maybe the next year? You know, for me, for Bitcoin, I just look at it as almost like a, um, a a gold or a neutral reserve asset for the people, and and that is favored by millennials uh, as they're you know coming into to more spending money, more saving, more investing. It's um, I, I I the happening to me makes sense in terms of being a catalyst. The thing that always sticks in my craw a little bit is just trying to understand exactly. And I don't track how big the futures have gotten uh, in, in Bitcoin, but just understanding how this paper tail can wag the dog. We've seen it with oil now in spades, just discussed how it you know can help or it can distort underlying supply demand fundamentals in gold for periods of time. We saw it when futures rolled out in at the end of 17 on, on Bitcoin, it obviously uh, I, I think it contributed to some of the drop in Bitcoin uh, prices in 2018. Uh, so to me, I just am always cognizant that when you have this derivative market attached to it, you're not dealing you know, to the stock to flow ratio model. Stock to flow ratio on Bitcoin might be even higher than gold. And so that means the ability to separate, you know, if you have a mature or a more mature futures market, the ability to separate the supply demand fundamentals from price is greater, the greater the stock to flow ratio is. And and so it's just, I think, something to be mindful of. But for, for me, ultimately, I just look at it as we're moving into a period of time where you have a confluence of factors driving changes in the monetary system at a time where you've got a bursting global sovereign debt bubble for the first time in 100 years. Central banks cannot afford to allow deflation for any sustained period of time, particularly in asset prices, because it's the only thing that drives demand. And so I say, all right, I, I need to own, I need to be overweight neutral reserve assets. And I understanding how, how futures can, can temper those prices in the near term ultimately 
I look at gold, I look at Bitcoin, I look at silver, and I say, okay. And then miners, uh, royalty companies, I say, I, I want to be overweight these as a group within my portfolio relative to what I might otherwise be. Because look, if I'm wrong, they also do well if the system collapses. And that's, they're really the only group of assets that do well if the system, if the central bankers are successful and they are able to take the balance sheet to whatever the number needs to be, whether that's 10 or 20 or 30 or 40 trillion, or if they're not, and the whole thing just comes unhinged, then those win too, as opposed to sort of the more traditional assets, which will do well if they succeed and do really poorly if they fail. And I, I, to me, it just speaks to, I like, I like the fact that if we're getting into a binary situation, I do okay either way with these group of assets, and that's not necessarily true elsewhere. Yeah. All right. Wow. That was fantastic. Luke Groman, ladies and gentlemen, give him a round of applause. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for having me on. The marathon <laughs> session. Whoa. Oh. That was incredible, Luke. Thank you very much. I sure appreciate your time. For Absolutely. the viewers who want to find out more about what you do, I know you've got a free newsletter. Where can they go to find out that info? Absolutely. So we, uh, if you go to fftt-llc.com, forest for the trees-llc.com, um, you can find a lot more about what we're up to. We have uh, a mailing list there that's free. We have Tree Rings, which is a very popular uh, small subscription fee uh, for people to uh, sign up for that. If you're interested, if you like what you hear, I think you'd really enjoy Tree Rings. So uh, that's the best place to check us out. And then, of course, on Twitter. As well. On Twitter, yes, I, I have a, a fairly active Twitter feed. <laughs> uh, yeah. so I'm there, uh, I'm there uh, quite a bit, and I try to uh, engage with uh, as many people as possible because, quite frankly, uh, I, uh, I, I I learn uh, a tremendous amount from everybody. So it's 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 a pleasure to uh, interact with people there. All right, Luke, can't wait to do it again, buddy. All right, hey, thanks so much for having me on, George. Always great talking to you.